You're now being given food for thought. <coughs> Sorry. Right, apologies to Ra, who knows this uh, schematic. Um, in fact, there's a couple of schematics that, that you know, but it's good revision for you for that exam. You're stressing around so much. Um, whether it's coaching, teaching, instructing, whatever, we know from way back, i.e. the 1970s, that there are variables that we need to factor in. And so um, before I go on to some of these sort of artistic components, I wanted to just make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what counts. All right, so um, to start off with, we have what we refer to as the presage variables, and I'll, I'll um, highlight what that uh, is referring to very shortly. You've got your context, which we've heard from this morning from your uh, roundtable discussions. Uh, that's incredibly variable, but also very, very appropriate. And then when the two of these two come together, <clears throat> we have what we refer to as the process variables. All right? These are the black box things. So when the, when the two come together, you have to make a series of calls as far as what's going to happen in here. So for many of you, for instance, this is what happens at your practice. This is what happens in the game. All right? you, take, you factor in who you are and where you are and who you're with or who your players are, etc., and then you have to make some decisions. And eventually, um, all going well, and as some of you have highlighted also this morning, uh, in many cases that has been uh, the outcome, you have your product of variables in terms of what are you going to get out of this. So it might be player learning, it might be um, mastering a particular set play, it might just be something like a win, um, but invariably, that's where you're heading towards. So the quote that we just had before uh, from Wheaton, as far as the, um, the Aussie rules book is concerned, that was what he was referring to, wasn't it? It was getting that best outcome for players or the team or whatever. And your job is to try and help, obviously, get them there. So if we look at the presage variables, all right, <coughs> this is you. All right, so one of the things that we have to know is we have to know ourselves. So, in that situation, there are obviously some, some pretty um, standardised things that we can refer to, like age and gender, etc. But I'd like you now, under that, just to take a personal perspective and tell me, or tell the group, if you like, what are the characteristics of you, the coach? Are you, for instance, hyper-competitive? Are you tolerant? Are you yada, 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 yada? See if you can give yourself four or five things. Qualities, perhaps. Um, things that you know, like obviously some of you referred to this morning, that things that you know you've got to work on. Uh, things that you know are probably perhaps one of your strongest qualities. And everybody hates sharing these, but it's important. So if you are in that an unenviable position of having to reapply for what might be a new job in your particular discipline and you were asked uh, by the panel, what do you think are your strongest qualities for this position, then hopefully what you've got in front of you is what you would refer to so that you do become the next state-of-the-art trampoline coach, whatever, <laughs> coach slash administrator. 15 hours of each. All right, so these are some of the things that we normally associate with this from a very generic perspective. All right? These are some of the sort of the demographic or generic things that 
um, align with what we would refer to as these presage variables. Right. So yes, social class, age, gender, yada, 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 yada. Now, they are almost objective measures, aren't they? They're not all, all objective, but you know, there's no doubt for most people, um, an age thing is very objective. You know, you're a number and that's it. All right. um, experience, well, most people, again, could objectify that. I've been doing this for nine years. Okay. But then it gets really interesting and it gets quite messy because we start to go into that again, that sort of that subjective side. Uh, what does that mean? So it means that obviously there's something very, very personal and obviously we're looking at this last one here too, aren't we, the personality traits. So what are some of the words, what are some of the descriptors, uh, what are some of the adjectives that people have thrown out? Okay. Positive. Focused. Focused. Competitive. Competitive. What's it like? <laughs> yep. Good. Cover them all. Listens. Good listener. Educated. All right. On that trustworthy, it's an interesting comment when it's a trustworthy. If you're trying to sign players and <coughs> you're trying to talk to them knowing that in certain instances of Sean properly, you know what we talk about around there, where you possibly want to get them into the environment but know that if you are truthful at that current status that you're talking to them, you may not be able to completely deliver. Mm -hmm. Which way do you go in actually sort of saying, I want you in the environment, but mainly what I'm going to sort of speak around may not be immediately achievable. Do you actually... That's, an, that's like an ethical decision, isn't yeah. it? It has to be made so at a personal level. Where then the lack of trust, I suppose, stems from <coughs> then, not then. It falls down because you know it's likely to fall down, mm. but at the moment, you may not be in a position to actually say for certain that that's... But if they can see how that's where they are right now, but it was how you all help them reach them to where they want to be, but the reality is you don't see them in that space yet, <coughs> like but as a player, wouldn't you way rather know that that's where you sit in the world at the end of those conversations? Because if you bring them in and they receive an experience that Yeah. Therein lies the. Therein, 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 it is hard though, isn't it? I mean, because underpinning all of that really should be uh, your ethical positioning. Yeah. And how, well, how, how, honest, how honest can you be or do you want to be? Yeah. Okay, context variables. Um, no surprises here. These are the conditions. Okay. So we plug that into the formula and we have things, for instance, like... Uh, for those of you that are working with individual athletes, will know what this is all about in particular. But invariably we find that you know, learner variables, plural, and or the group size can have a huge impact um, on how much progress you're able to make. Either within a session, within a particular skill drill perhaps, uh, where some sort of set piece is being learned or some particular movement like a double back layout with a double barani on the trampoline or whatever. 
Um, you know, that's, that's entirely up to you, isn't it, in terms of what you know about that learner, as long as you know about that learner uh, as part of the process. Uh, and we've heard this morning, um, prior to lunch, this word culture coming up several times, haven't we? So in certain environments we know that there are particular cultures that will thrive and other cultures that we would probably say are destructive more than anything else. So we're starting to see that there is a, an enmeshing of a whole range a whole raft of variables that we've got to start to consider, particularly when we line you know, one up against the other. All right? So your age and your experience and your intelligence as a coach, or what you might just know, and who you are as a coach in terms of those personality traits, you put them up against a particular learner, what are you going to do? How are you going to do it? What process are you going to employ? What tricks have you got up your sleeve? Um, what have you learned from experience, etc., etc.? So we then get into this area of the process variables, which we refer to as the black box, because you know, a lot of the time we just don't know what's going on. We don't know what's going on inside your head, inside the learner or the player's head. We don't necessarily know what's uh, going on from one context to another. So whilst you might pick up these books uh, ad infinitum about coaching and coaches, uh, invariably they do not play out in your own world because the context is so specific. On the other hand, when we do start to look at this area of the process variables, we can start to uh, hone in on some of the aspects of pedagogy, the P word, uh, that we know are very appropriate. All right? So for instance, we know that if we do certain things in certain ways, we can inv uh, invariably uh, control player behavior by the systems that we set up and the way that we do things, and the expectations that we place on our player or players. All right? And we know, for instance, that if we have um, certain ways that things happen, and we look at how our process variables and our context variables inter intertwine, if you like, then we start to actually see of ways that things will work. And that's invariably what we're wanting to do, isn't it? Because obviously one of, the, one of the chief products here is learning. We're wanting our players to learn certain things. But we have to take so many things into consideration. So we were having a conversation just before uh, lunch uh, about this whole notion of the behavioural factor. And in days gone by, particularly in sort of the, the 1980s and 90s, behaviorism was the, the paradigm that everybody talked about in coaching and worked in. And for some reason, uh, it became unpopular. Now, whether or not that was the, uh, the arrival of sports science, the hard sciences, it's just hard to know. But a lot of the things that we want to do as far as improving goes is we have to change our behavior. Not necessarily our performance, it's our behavior. And likewise with our players. So how do we do that? What tricks have we got up our sleeve in terms of you know, what's available to us, the qualities that we have, that we can actually start to do things like influence player behaviour? Because once we've got that done, then we can look at the things that we want to achieve as outcomes. All right? What are the outcomes of coaching? All right? And invariably, we want our players to learn. We want them to grow. All right? And... Yes, we want them to act in certain ways. Now, the activity, uh, act, well, sorry, the attitude towards the activity might just be, for instance, what the player thinks about their sport. So we've heard, for instance, this morning about the riding example of one student that just didn't seem to want to be there or had a very specific way about how they see the world. And in terms of what you do as the coach when you deal with somebody like that, that requires certain skills on your part, but also you've got to be able to read that player, who they are and what they do, how they tick, if you like, and then come up with some sort of formula in this black box, which is not black, it's, it's, a, it's a, sort of a lovely lilac colour. Um, but the crucial thing is that you have to come up, you have to make a decision about how you're going to deal with this, how are you are going to come up with it? Uh, has it got something to do with, for instance, the learner variables? And this might even be, for instance, the ethnicity of the group. So how many of you, for instance, work in an environment that is multi-ethnic? Yeah, I was just speaking about, we, we have a number of uh, foreign players, and some of them don't actually speak great English. Yep. And I'm not too sure, realistically, whether they 
completely understand what I'm actually saying at the time. They smile and nod their head, but I'm not too sure. But yeah, I'm, yeah, if anybody's got any sort of how better to actually communicate so that we translate. Yeah, get a translator. You get out there on the thing. Yeah. Like I've been in an environment, Wayne in an environment, got a coach spoke a different language, so I had no idea what he was saying. Right. I just did what I thought he was saying. Yeah. And he came across and said, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a no clue. Because even if you say no, what are they going to do? Yeah, I had a, um, a conversation with a, a Canterbury rugby coach, and they were having a team talk, and they'd had a, a, they had a, a, Ro a Romanian player playing down there. This was a few years back. And the backline coach actually said, and I won't say who the person was, but the backline coach actually said, um, we'll call him Juan. Juan, you're an enigma. <laughs> and he said, no, I'm not. I'm a Romanian. <laughs> I mean, he just had no idea what the term meant. And it's like, you know, the, everything was lost uh, just through that, that whole communication thing. Um, so we, we've, we find that it gets very, very complex. I mean, so the... The take-home message here is that you know, if we want to achieve that product, that product area, then we have to take a huge number of things into consideration when we start to deal with you know, putting these, these parallel factors, these variables side by side. So I mentioned about this notion of the art uh, and behaviorism, etc. And a lot of what was going on um, initially in the, in the idea of, of what behaviorism was was uh, basically treating it as a science. So a lot of the sports psychology, for instance, was very much about theories. Uh, and people tried to you know, almost diagnose situations by applying a particular theory. Oh, this is so-and-so. Um, so that it became certain. Uh, it became a cold, hard fact. Where in actual fact, you know, we know that uh, that's just folly, for want of a better word. So some of the behavioural aspects are very important in the coaching realm, but trying to actually turn them into a science can be very, very dangerous. And we do that at our chagrin. All right. uh, one, of my, one of my most respected uh, people in our, in our field in sport pedagogy is Elliot Eisner, who's unfortunately passed on. But um, he had this whole idea that you know, you can't just assume that if you get all of these things right, you will have the product. So if we go back to the, the diagram that we just had, the schematic, that's a classic example. Right. We can't say, for instance, that coaching is just about this, this, this and this. There's a whole lot of other things that we do have to take into consideration. But we can at least try sometimes to classify, to compartmentalise, um, to align things or to get some sort of flow to help us in our own thinking. Because invariably, if we use some sort of classification or categorization, it makes us think in certain ways. So when I asked you, for instance, to put yourself on that, that continuum, look what we got. And look what ensued from that in terms of the discussion and the way that some of you were thinking about that. So you know, it, it's got its place. We've just got to make sure that we don't end up um, it becoming a, a rule, if you like, of, of what it is that we try and do. So it can't, it can't operate under some sort of prescription. You cannot pick up um, a coaching manual and assume that you start at chapter one and work your way through to chapter 13. At the end of it, it's all go. You can then apply for your representative job or your top level job or whatever. We know that it's incredibly complex and along the way, there's a huge number of things that won't be part of that description or that prescription, I should say. All right? So... Some of the things that you work with probably very, very closely in the realm of science are very, very helpful. So the way you run your practices, uh, the training schedules that you have, um, you know, if you're looking, like for instance, if you are on the lake and you're doing um, your training sessions, etc., then you've probably got some, some person sticking a needle into your earlobe getting blood lactate levels or whatever. That helps us... Um, to get some sort of information in terms of what's going on, but it's not the full picture. All right? It doesn't give us the absolute certainty because we know there are lots of other things when we look at that previous schematic about our athletes. So I remember, for instance, having a, one of my many conversations um, with Dick Tonks, 
And Dick always used to say that, you know, he always had a plan for each morning session, but usually he would end up just standing or sitting in the boat and watching his rowers bring the craft down uh, the little pathway, because in those days it was in the old building, um, and that was when he made the call. He would make a decision about you know, how far down the lake they'd go and how many repetitions they'd do, etc., just by watching them. And it was nothing to do with science. He just got a feel for where they were at uh, by watching them. And maybe you've had instances like that in your own practices where you can arrive and straight away you pick up the feeling of the group. You know exactly what's going on. And you have to make a decision. Do I go with the the play, the score if you like, going back to our orchestration metaphor, or do I adjust it because I'm now seeing something that's totally different? That's the black box, right? because straight away those variables have been messed up, so to speak, from what you had originally planned to do. So yes, there are things that we can do in the way that we plan things out, but we also have to be very aware that you know they are not a case in point, they are not certainty. Because we know, as we said earlier, this is all very fluid. It's all very subjective. So yes, the environments are dynamic. But you do have to deal with the here and now. What is going on right here and now? Uh, they're, <laughs> they're incredibly dynamic. Uh, and yes, some people would say that chaos rules. Uh, that's a big part of it. So we've got some decisions that we have to make in terms of how we deal with all of this stuff. How do you do that? How do you make the right decisions so that your variables line up the way that you want them to and you get the product that you're looking for? That takes a huge amount of skill, a lot of expertise, an enormous amount of knowledge and some really strong personal qualities. And in the area of education, because I think coaching's a lot to do with education and teaching, etc., uh, we would refer to this as connoisseurship. What does that mean? Well, you know what a connoisseur is, don't you? When we say connoisseur, who do we normally associate it with? Wine? <laughs> the truth is out. With fine food, yeah. Yeah. Who else? Who else can you think of? That would probably fall under the umber of connoisseur. Expert. Okay. Any other areas other than wine, food? Every area. Art. Yep. A judge. Or a judge, yes. Definitely a connoisseur. You can be a connoisseur in anything, though. You can. What does it mean? Expert? Yep. I'm trying to remember that TV ad that used to be on about the, the tea bags. You know, the, the guy that used to be able to tea, you know, taste the tea. A, a, a certain taste? Yeah. So maybe it's got something to do with the senses. Maybe it's a sensual thing. Ooh. Mm, hello, Tiger. Um, okay. So sometimes, for instance, the connoisseur is able to sort of pick up on things that other people can't. All right? They are able to describe and read what cannot be put into words. Yeah. <coughs> what we sometimes refer to as gut feeling. Yeah? You get a gut feeling. So you know, the example that I was just using about Dick Tonks, for instance, is a classic example. All right? You get an impression. Right. So I'm standing here and I'm looking around the room and I'm getting an impression. Right? Are we in the post-lunch phase where people would really like to just have a little doze now? Right? So you know, I, I can't actually explain what that is and what it means, but you know, a lot of people talk about, oh, never speak after lunch because everybody's a zombie by that stage. You know? It was like trying to teach in Christchurch when there was a Norwester going on. I mean, kids would just sit there like half-suck jubes, as I would say. All right. um, it's just something that's very, very hard to pinpoint. But somehow, some people are able to do that, all right? and they make the call. Um, 
I can't remember. Uh, who's, who's our football person here? Who's the, who was the German coach that made the amazing substitution before the end of the game? It was in one of the World Games. might have been the World Cup final, and he brought the guy on for, to do the goalkeeping. Yeah, the penalty shootout. I, I can't, was it, it wasn't Klinsmann, Kleinsmann, was it? Jürgen Kleinsmann. I can't remember who it was, but it was a really astute move, wasn't it? Because there, was there was only minutes left on the clock. And he made the substitution. Yeah. Just you know, unbelievable. Now, what was behind that? How could he have done that? There was something that he knew. There was something that you just couldn't describe. Yep. Yep. And could see that it was going to go to a shootout. So now was the time to make a call. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's probably you can probably think of examples in your own sporting realms or situations where those sorts of things happen. You know, there's just like, why have they done that? Why, why did they do that? Um, there's something that they do or know, something that they're able to uh, formulate that uh, allows them to make that sort of thing. And these people are the ones that have that sort of appreciation. And a lot of the time we find coaches talking to other coaches about this very thing. You know, they start to appreciate some of these moves, some of these calls. So you think back, for instance, you know, through that World Cup cam campaign and some of the substitutions and moves that have been made, and you really do want to ask, sit down and ask some of these coaches, you know, why did you do that then? Um, both winning coaches and losing ones, I suppose. But uh, there is that sort of appreciation, right? They've got the bigger picture. Uh, they've got the ideas about what has to happen and why. So these people are the ones that basically end up creating something new. Right? They have the imagination to say, uh, this has got to go here or this has got to go there. This has got to happen and at this stage this can't happen because. So they make the call. Now if you think about your own coaching worlds and your own situations, your own context, going back to that little box that was down the bottom here, the context variables, if you think about that situation in your own worlds, can you think of a, a time or a place where that has happened, where you have had to invent something. You've had to actually use your imagination to overcome something that was obviously causing duress or maybe even causing some sort of uh, likely negative outcome, i.e. loss or under a certain time or getting cut or not making the playoffs or not staying in the championship or whatever. When have you invented? Yep. Yep. You've had that in hockey? Yep. Because we can make substitutions regularly, we can take a player off and put an impact player off. Yep. Absolutely. And he's got the results to back it, so who's going to argue? Yeah. Other situations? Based on? Um, based on a number of different factors. I had one, um, one girl who went to national, she'd done a hundred of her voluntary routines in the month leading up, got there and she couldn't bounce. So we took that routine out of the situation, she was fine. Just um, we were looking at places, if you were in a situation where you have other routine or a simpler routine, or a harder routine is needed, or yep. things pop up just and 
decided to, I guess, difficulty <coughs> go from um, eight doubles and assaults to ten, just for the final to see if he could psych my guy out. Got on to his ten somersaults. It didn't work, but you know, just things like that. It was all but he knew he could do it. <laughs> you know, just yeah. little things. People, people do it often. I'll do it. You see other coaches doing it. Um, you see it happen at international competition as well. Yep. One more example. Yeah, I, think, I think for me, it's probably something that happens a lot, but it's only magnified when there's something on the line. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's probably when a statement obvious to the experience. I think experience is a yeah, key we, word we, there, we, isn't it? We played last Friday and we put our kid, we put a boy onto the wing who was never, never played at night, never played a first class game. First game, first game for the white belt. First year out of school, we put him on the wing. But I guess it was magnified, that decision was magnified because what was on the line and it was, people made a lot of it. But this is come back to that. That's the sort of things you just highlighted before, knowing the player. Yep. Knowing the situation. Yeah, and if you don't do it, you never know what might have been. Yeah, that's right. We knew what we were going to get out of the other guys and not having been good enough for the last couple of weeks. Yep. Why not? I stuck that one up once, three years ago. We had a first five who played brilliant rugby, and then we had a second five who stand out the whole season, and we got to the semi-final for the national and right from the start of the game, you could tell she wasn't on, and we should have made the decision earlier to pull it. Yep. Um, yep. And we didn't. Because we're like, she'll come right, we trust in her, she's played so well the whole time. But there was that moment where you knew it just wasn't on, and we, we pulled her, and it was 10 minutes into the second half, but it was too late. They were like, we had won every game the whole season by heaps. Um, and it was for her, the pressure of the sideline was like the whole school from the other team was there yelling about how shit she was and it just got her and she couldn't come out of it. But when we made the change, we scored four tries in a real short period of time but we lost by five points. But we should have pulled up our instinct and made that decision even though it was different to how we played the whole season. When you were saying that, I was thinking about a, a certain Australian first 5-8 that has probably suffered a similar fate uh, when they play in New Zealand. Yeah, good call. So yes, it is that matter of not necessarily just dealing with the plan or the routine. We've got to actually work beyond that and, and make the calls. And if we are taking into consideration who that player is and who you are uh, and what's at stake, but more importantly what you are really trying to achieve, then you've got to get beyond You've got to get beyond that routine. You've got to get beyond uh, maybe what was planned uh, to get the result, to get the outcome. Do you think to be able to do that, make those um, brave decisions or changes, um, you first will need to have that. Like I think if, as a coach you've got that complete buy-in from the team. When you do those things, it might look strange on the outside, but within the team there should still be that calm of, I trust that. Yeah, I think I think that's a. I mean, that's a good good question. Um, there's two things there. Obviously, hopefully, there's the trust that the players would have in you as a coach, but also hopefully the culture and the way that you do things that you've set up, they would understand why you've done it. Um, and I think that's one of the things you know, as uh, many coaches don't do, uh, the players are just never in that situation where they understand why that might have happened. Yeah. So I think sometimes that can happen too often. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, sticking with this notion of the connoisseur, um, I, I've used this quote because it highlights one thing, obviously. But I think the really important thing here is that word timing. Because nine times out of ten, the connoisseur, as well as the sensual stuff like taste, etc., um, the connoisseur is able, yeah, to time things right. So whether it's in a substitution of a player or whether it's making a certain call at a certain time 
or in a rowing situation, you know, it's like, right, we're going to go at 1700 uh, for a particular reason. It's about getting the timing right. And invariably we know that um, in a lot of sports and a lot of sporting situations and contexts, timing is everything. Uh, and it's like in jazz. And again, I'll go back to my uh, plug for the, that movie, Whiplash, you know, because the, the coach, the, 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 the conductor, uh, in that in that movie, you know, it was all about timing. I mean, he just tell this jazz band to right, we'll go from bar one twenty five, and then they would play like three bars, and he would stop them uh, and bollock everybody because the timing wasn't right. And invariably, you know, he would play it four or five times over. And for us, run of the mill jazz appreciators, we'd have no idea in the difference between the different uh, tempos. But he could pick it up. Uh, he's the connoisseur. He's that orchestra conductor. And so again, going back to the conductor that we had at the start, you know, playing Beethoven's symphony, the conductor is the connoisseur as far as the timing goes. So yes, everybody can do their bit uh, and play to a certain tempo, but you've got to be that connoisseur standing at the front, up on the podium, uh, with your baton, making the calls as far as the timing is concerned. When you bring in a certain section, or you fade another group out, or you ask another group to be a bit stronger, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. or you know you've got a star uh, brass section, so you you know you highlight them uh, in terms of you know getting the others to quieten down a little bit. That is what it's all about. It's it's timing, uh, and how do we learn that? Experience. Experience. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's an art, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. And we, like I see now, coaches coming through, I'll wait till you get to watch somebody. You're right, but for long term, though, it's a very difficult. Yeah. It's a very difficult. It's actually, sure. like I said, those players down and then actually get the ball and they're actually in the middle of the field. Yeah. 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 Y
enough situations whereby you know you actually can start to feel or experience what it's like to be a connoisseur of netball or rowing or rugby or hockey or whatever. Um, I mean, for me, Lois was just one of the greatest coaches I've ever had anything to do with, just in terms of you know, talking with her, watching her, listening to her with the players. She was a connoisseur of the game. And it wasn't just the game as far as the skills and the tactics, etc. It was the whole practice of netball, whatever that means. All right? So, you know, a doctor has a practice, all right? and the practice involves all sorts of things. You have to do certain things. You have to know certain things. But when Ra comes to me with a particular problem, within that practice, you know, I have to size things up and I have to make a call. And hopefully it's the right call in terms of whether I send him away with a sugar-coated lolly or whether I refer him to a specialist. But the really important thing is that I get to the point whereby every time somebody pretty much comes into my surgery, as far as the practice goes and what I know about Ra or whoever, I can make a call as to what should happen. And that is where we start to see these people that we refer to as connoisseurs. An enormous amount of ability and knowledge but also able to put it into practice so they make the right calls at the right time. Because we all make mistakes, we're all human. But I think the really important thing is that it's those things that you can actually import. Importing the import. Right. Certain things that you can bring on board and how you do it. And those of you that you know, spent time with a GP will know exactly what I'm talking about in terms of you know, the process that they go through. And there are lots of things that, for instance, that they will rule out first before they'll start to look at the things that they're going to call that it might be this or this or this. But invariably we know that, you know, we hope that we're dealing with a connoisseur. Uh, it's the same with the surgeon, isn't it? Uh, so my wife, who's a physio, uh, works with a, uh, a surgeon who does heart by bypasses. And um, he's, he's an international and if you meet this guy, it's just really, really scary because he's got fingers like sausages. And you take one look at the guy and you think, geez, I hope you never do a bypass on me. Because when you look at his fingers, you think, how on earth can a person of that you know, ability and skill perform heart surgery with fingers like that? I mean, they're huge. Um, but for some reason, it works. He does it. He's a connoisseur with the experience that he's got and the way that he does things, uh, it's just something that you can't put into words. And yet for the average person on the street, you'd think there is no way that that guy could be a heart surgeon. Uh, it's a really, really fascinating area, but it is something that we are trying to achieve in our careers. And it's what it comes down to is, you know, what do we mean by that term? So, what you've got to eventually do, like a lot of these people that we call connoisseurs, is that you have to make decisions. So we've heard just very recently about some of the situations or the scenarios where you have made a decision. And a lot of what goes on out there as far as the art of coaching is concerned comes down to this very thing. All right? It's about decision making. All right? Decision making when, so when Ra was talking before about you know, his plan for the session. You make decisions when you do that plan. You make decisions when you rock up to the practice. You make decisions when you're on the sideline uh, or where, wherever you operate from. The whole process is about decisions. And usually that decision that you make is because of a prior decision that you've made or not made. So it's an ongoing process. And... Those of us that get the formula right, right from the word go, invariably are the people that we refer to as the connoisseurs. They seem to be able to make the right decisions, and if it's not quite the right decision, they change it very, very quickly. Uh, they can see what, it, what the Im implications or the ramifications are for what it is that they've chosen to do. So it's a chain. It's a chaining of events. All right? So some of the things that you might, for instance need to make um, a particular decision on. Choose one of those and just put down how that might apply in your coaching environment. Choose one of those, one of those areas, topic, matter, time management, space, whatever. Something that's pertinent to your world as a coach.
Enough time? Right, who picked player organisation? Anybody? Tell us about it. Through, uh, well, I've got to expect, I've, I had a trial list, came all the way from Chile. He came as a centre forward. When I looked at him, I didn't feel that his dynamics actually suited that position, and what he was showing me certainly wasn't something that. So I've asked him to, to, to reposition himself as a centre back. It's a little bit of a project that I feel actually will, will come through. And it's just looking at it and making the call that realistically he wouldn't still be here. Yep. If, if he was only prepared to play in the position that he came to this country to yep. do. But he is actually showing very good signs. Call it intuition, it's just something that I looked at and just went, yep. I don't feel that you're... That was going to be my next question. So what was your here? What was your decision based on? I mean, when you said you looked at him and he just dynamics. didn't... His dynamics as a footballer in relation to what I was looking for yeah. from, from our team and also other players that I had in those areas. Yeah. He was not likely to actually surpass those. But I did feel that he could have some decent dynamics to yeah. play in a different position. And that's what we're trying now to work through to try and Give him a position in the squad. Yeah, good. Uh, good. Um, who picked up space? Well, um, in the Hauda, you put a grass track. So, quite often in summer, I sometimes have to make judgment calls on whether, especially it's been raining during the day. It was raining at, the mo on, at that moment, it's an easy decision to make. But sometimes when um, it's rained early in the day, We've got to make a call, and sometimes as the kids are warming up, I'll make the call whether we can safely actually do the training because the grass tracks get quite slippery. Yep, yep. Um, or, uh, or we don't want to have to completely change what the plan is. And quite often it's a case we make that decision as the kids are warming up. Yep. They've still got the beautiful gardens at Hawara with the magnificent rhododendrons. and. Oh, um, no one part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stunning. Yeah, sorry, I digress. Uh, <laughs> time management, who took, who took that? Anyone? Um, a classic example was this morning, we didn't have much time to come here, so we had to short those two days and then we had to So you were training while the test was on? Yeah. I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm impressed. Well, that's good, mate. I wanted to train this morning. I to train Yeah, good call. Good call. The other thing is that um, you have to make some decisions, obviously, in terms of your behaviour and the way that you interact with your players, the style that you use. All right, so... Uh, we know, for instance, in days gone by that the coach, the predominant co coaching style was the command style. Right? You basically led everything, you made all the calls, you determined how things would be done, etc., etc. Right? You dished it up and your players responded to it. So it was a simple behavioural relationship. Um, and nine times out of ten, um, that was considered to be the effective way of doing things. Simon says. Right? And in some environments, it's still very appropriate. In some environments, it's still very prevalent, but it's not appropriate. But we do know that in a lot of environments, that's the thing that people will rely on. And so your players become very dependent on you as the coach. So when you get into that situation whereby you have got to make decisions on the field as a player or on the court or wherever, you're not very good at doing that because you've never actually practiced making decisions because your coach hasn't facilitated that skill or that opportunity. So, you know, in that situation, the command style is not necessarily the best one. Some people would use a practice pedagogy, whereby, you know, the best way to learn this and to apply it, etc., is to put yourself into a series of practice situations. So if you're learning a particular football skill, you might be doing it uh, in a grid system. They still use grids? 
you try and get away from it. Um, you know, in that situation, you might be in grids uh, and little boxes on the field, etc., and you might be doing um, a three-on-three -three task of some sort, and then you you uh, employ some sort of uh, pressure ratio so that instead of three-on-three, -three, you have three-on-four or three-on-five. Uh, then you start to learn the skill a hell of a lot better in some coaches' eyes. But in that situation, you are giving your opponents, if you like, different practice situations or different pressure ratios. So if they're learning it straight off from the get-go, then obviously you would give them an advantage. So you're three versus two passive defenders. Uh, but in that situation, your players are getting lots of opportunities. And so you might just do you know, some sort of informing uh, task whereby you are practicing a particular pass in hockey or you're doing a particular um, uh, movement up and down the court in netball or whatever. If you can, you put your players in as many different situations as possible whereby they not only learn what that move is or what that strategy might be, but at the same time they can apply it in a whole lot of different situations to the point where it becomes automatic. Or we could do an interactive model. So a lot of the coaching that's done in that situation, we start to actually see the scales tip and the players, our players start to have a bit of a voice or a bit of an input in terms of what's going on. And we start to seek out their feedback. And so, you know, in the timeouts or whatever, it's not so much me bollocking the players or telling the players what we've got to do. I start to ask questions. A, because I want them to be thinking on their feet, but also uh, because it tells me what they know or maybe don't know, or how they are reading the game. Or maybe they can even tell me things that I haven't picked up on. Because 30 heads are better than one, or 12 heads are better than one. So wherever possible, that's what we start to do. And then we, we work right through to the point where we get to problem solving. So who's used teaching games for understanding as a model? Anyone here, a few of you? So the TGFU thing is based around solving problems, isn't it? You put your players in a particular situation in a mini game of some sort and you get them to try and make decisions within that mini game that's hopefully going to lead to the bigger goal of what it is that we had as our product variable. All right, so in that situation, the whole idea then is that I step out and make myself uh, dispensable and I let my players do the solving. Because in a lot of the situations, that's what we want to happen come game time. We want them to make those decisions and we want them to make the good ones. So wherever possible, they feel confident, but they've also got the experience at doing that. So the coaching style can be very, very important. And obviously it doesn't have to be uh, the same style right through a practice or a game situation. That can change. All right. Those of you who have you know, been in competitive situ situations will know exactly what I'm talking about. Sometimes you do have to flick from the one to the other. And it doesn't have to be the same from session to session. Uh, but the really important thing is it's like horses for courses. You know, What's the best pedagogy or style of coaching to use for the goals that you want to achieve for that session? Make sense? So let's have a look at this whole notion of uh, decision making. Um, I did a paper with uh, one of my colleagues, Brett Smith. Do you know Brett? Sports scientist, yep. Rugby fraternity, you all know Brett. Um, and one of the things that he was looking at during his, um, his doctoral research was this whole notion of you know, how and why coaches make decisions. In that case, it was, it was rowing. Um, and he was looking at overtraining. All right. So how do coaches decide when they are in a situation whereby it's what they would classify as overtraining. So you've pushed your athletes over the edge, so to speak. You know, you've just given them too much. And in that situation, uh, it became very apparent when we started to interview and talk to the coaches that they had certain ideas as to what that meant and how they responded to it or what they thought the cause of it might be. Um, and I wanted to just share with you some of the things that... Uh, the coaching world now has picked up on. If you, if you read the coaching periodicals and texts, uh, this term of uh, uh, the situational or local decision making, um, sometimes referred to as naturalistic decision making, all right, looking at decision making in natural environments, uh, has become quite sexy. Um, whether or not it is is just another matter, but it is one of those things that the coaches feel is really important. 
So we know, for instance, that yes, sometimes this whole idea of making a decision can have a whole uh, raft of uh, iterations, of versions, all right? And it can go anywhere from you know, non-deliberate right through to obviously overtly deliberate. But the crucial thing is that, yeah, we make our decisions and then we have to live with them. And how do coaches who are considered to be effective or maybe even connoisseurs, how do they make those decisions? How do you do it? What is it based on? Most of the um, so-called you know, specialist coaches or top level effective coaches will keep referring back to this whole notion of reading. All right? Top level coaches can read. They can read their players, they can read the game, they can read the opposition. It's very much a subjective behavior. It's very much a subjective uh, ability or talent, but it is subjective. It's an art. So it's yet another thing that we have to put into the art basket or the art bag. How do you read coaching environments? So if I was to come along and watch each and every one of you practicing, um, I would have to get a read on your practice, wouldn't I? I would have to get a read for what you're trying to do and how you're doing that. And then, of course, I sort of tick around in my head about whether I think that's effective or not. And it's got nothing to do with me because I probably know nothing about your sport. But I might know something about you know, learning and behaviour, etc. Uh, that may be of help. But you're the one that has to read that environment and make the call on what it's all about. So naturalistic decision making has become very, very in vogue. Uh, and it's an interesting thing to look at because um, a lot of the time, and I think uh, Rich might have actually touched on this, about this whole notion about subconsciously making decisions, whether you know it or not. Uh, there are things that go on in your head that you just do uh, for some reason. Uh, it's almost like it's an instinctive thing or it's a subconscious thing, but invariably we know that that's what happens. Right? So you act on this almost subconscious process that's going on. Certain things just happen and you pick up these triggers or these cues and you make the decision. So in the case of the rowing research, you know, it was a lot about, you know, again, the player's behaviour. The certain facial expressions or the certain things that they said or did. It was nothing to do with the blood lactate levels or you know, what they were pulling in terms of stroke rate or whatever they like to call it these days, um, you know, or the cadence or the synchronicity or whatever. It was just something totally different that the coach could pick up on straight away and tell us about that. Uh, but it is, it is something that we don't know about it until we get into your world, until we get into your natural environment. So there's not, as we said before, there are not hard and fast rules about this. There are no objective measures that we can apply. It's just something that happens in your world, in your situation. And you have to be able to read that to make those decisions. So if it is putting a young fella on the wing uh, and making the call about that, it's because you've read the game and you've made a decision in that environment at that time, knowing full well that you know, there are certain things that you want to achieve, whether it's winning the game or avoiding relegation or whatever, it just, you know, that's the decision that you have to make. Right? And so we know that if you've got a certain amount of experience in particular, which is probably the most important thing for you to have, if you've got a certain amount of experience, you can do that. So a lot of the work that's been done on this whole idea of um, naturalistic decision making has been done in medicine. Because we know that surgeons, for instance, have to make calls, don't they? They make the calls based on their experience. They make the calls on what they think is going to work, what is going to be right, and you hope that they're going to be right. Uh, particularly if you're the one on the, on the slab at the time. All right? But the really important thing is that, yes, with that experience, you are able to read the situation. This one thing there is, I don't know, is it technique for you when you see in your, your, your training? Is that something that you know that you've gone, you've blown out, or how do you know? Oh, I guess I'm still learning that aspect of it all, but it's, uh, yeah, it, it's a fine line because obviously in endurance sports you want to train towards the limit and find out where the limit is when they don't actually yep. know where the limit is. Yep. And sometimes as you're younger, you almost got to push them over that limit to see what signals they give you because everyone's different. 
I mean, arguably, you know, for the future, I'm not saying it's the best way, but it's probably the only way you're going to know how that process is going to react when you've actually gone through the limit or if they've actually reached their limit. So it's, I guess there are some common traits, and it, yeah, it does come down to generally like their form. Over, not over one day or two days, but like, even after, after probably, generally you make motion calls for us on Monday, so we normally have Sunday off. Yeah. On Monday, if they're still shattered from the previous week, you probably monitor it closely, but yeah, and you sort of look for the trends. Because that's one thing that I use specifically in you know, making the decision on training or whatever, is it's actually really key for me. Yeah. The technique starts off poorly and then they're in trouble. So you just have to change the double training decision. So I just ask Heine. Because mm. he used when he wants to sub somebody. You know, and you know, you can see that they're not actually getting the particular parts of the field or the technique. Yeah. And there's probably all sorts of experiential things that you can factor into that, just given the, the years that you've had as a hockey coach, that you can plug in and think, if I do this, this is likely to be the outcome, and therefore you can make the call. Um, I mean, we look around the room and see how many beginning coaches have we got here. You, know, you need to have that experiential base, you know, nine times out of ten. And yes, you can get that from being involved in the sport you, yourself, but if you came in cold, you know, to be a rowing coach at elite level, if you didn't have that experiential base, then it would be a very, very hard thing to do, wouldn't it? Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it does something else probably pick up. That comes back to the instinct a little bit as well, probably. But yeah, it's hard for me going to go into the equestrian or something like that. I'd be as much fish out of water. Absolutely. You and me both. brave enough to step on the up and you know make a decision right then and there you know you could really hurt yourself yeah really yep. hurt yourself no. professionally the, uh the rider i see what you mean rider. right gotcha it's about health yep. and safety because there's sometimes when i get people lined up at the beginning of the class five people in the line i haven't even seen them trot I haven't even seen them walk sometimes. Yeah. And they're sitting, you know, back like this, like they're sitting in an easy chair and their horse's ears are back and his nostrils are all clenched up. And, and I think to myself, hmm, this mother said this kid could actually jump a meter. I'm going to, this is going to be interesting. So it's, you know, floating all the time. Hello, St. John's. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So... Yeah, we know that there's, a, there's an enormous amount of uncertainty there. Um, John Lyle, who's done a huge amount of work in the UK, uh, in this whole area of coach education especially, um, you know, he's just talked about these, these whole areas of, of uh, uncertainty and control. That's what we're basically dealing with. A lot of the time it's the uncertain, and we're trying to take control of that uh, as coaches. And it's a big ask, but at the same time, uh, we, we've got to do it. Uh, because if you don't get it right, if you don't make the call, then obviously it's a bit like the players. How do you know what, what might have been? Um, you know, reflectively, you might think that it was a good call or a bad call or whatever, but you've got to make that call anyway, ir irrespective of what the outcome might be. Because uh, there is no hard and fast rule about this. From sport to sport, situation to situation, we know that it can change. And you can be in a pretty similar situation, make the same call, and find that it was completely the wrong one, even though it was very similar to a similar situation you've been in before. Because there's something there that we haven't factored in, and it might be to do with the context or the opposition or the player or whatever, uh, but there are. There are no givens. I'm not sure if you're going to hear this, this next thing, but um, with this little clip, but I'm just going to try and get the message across with a lighter moment. But what we find when we do this, this, this whole idea of making the decisions is this is what's happening, isn't it? You are building a story in your head about what is going on. So there's a narrative running through the old brain the whole time, and you're thinking about scenarios, which is like sort of the end of the story, you know, whether it leaves people hanging on a cliff or it's a very predictable ending that's a real cheesy American-type police cop drama or whatever. Uh, you are building that story. And so eventually you have to try and make the call in terms of you know, what the outcome of the story is going to be. But you will be putting all that together. 
and your plot is obviously taking a certain tack with certain decisions. Your characters are obviously your players, etc., etc. It's understanding uh, how you go through that process and understanding what the story is all about is part of that whole deal. Uh, because, you know, sometimes we think and talk in pictures and images and sometimes we think in terms of words and we do tell stories about things. And people like stories. I think I've got that wound up. You've got to make decisions. <laughs> so let's just, uh, let's just factor in some of the things that this decision making encompasses or includes. Um, Ra, you'll know this. You'll recognize this. So here's our triad, right? This is my triad. Um, and this is, I'm, I'm basically steering this towards this notion of, of the decision making, etc. So you've got your three parties to it, right? There's you at the top. Of course, you know, we've got to put you at the top. Um, the coach is up there, we've got the player or players, and we've got your sports code, be it whatever. Okay? So when the coach is working with the player, for instance, to try and uh, create some sort of learning or some sort of outcome, etc., then normally that interaction involves some sort of teaching or some sort of instruction, some sort of coaching process. So the, the, the stuff that I had there on that previous slide about using the command style or the interactive style or whatever, that is what you choose to get that message across to your player. Yeah? You make the call on that. If, however, we've got a situation whereby we're talking about the interaction between the coach and the sports code, right, the connection between those two, that is your content knowledge, isn't it? And that's what invariably coaching has been all about. So a lot of people would say that, you know, how can you possibly coach if you've never played the game or if you don't know a great deal about the rudiments of rugby, hockey, rowing, netball, etc., long distance spitting, whatever it is, right? The really important thing is there's got to be some sort of knowledge factor uh, and whether it's the intricacies of that sport or whatever, it doesn't matter. That is what's crucial. So you have to know the game and that's what your players look for as well, obviously. And then between the player and the sports code is